taking part in the 2018 Brasses Valley Business Forum. Please enjoy this breakout session replay recorded by Water to Wine Productions. This video is presented in part by the Bank and Trust. Good morning, I'm Jia Wang. Um, I'm a professional researcher. Uh, I do human resource development on a daily basis. So I'm really excited and feel very privileged to have this opportunity to share with you my research passion. I don't, I don't like to label myself as a researcher because my real passion is really to use my research-based evidence to help organizations, real-life people, to make improvement. So when I was invited to come here in the summertime, I'm thinking, hmm, is that a real thing? I was deep into actually editing my book. I, I, I'm so excited. I want to share my very first book. Uh, it's a product of working with wholesale distribution. It's called Optimizing Human Capital Development. And I was really passionate. I'm very deep into culture, engagement. How do we engage people? So I'm just very privileged and honored to have this opportunity. Culture is my favorite topic, not because I'm diverse. I'm a woman, I'm international, that's not a reason. And I've always been passionate about culture because the more I study culture, the more I understand why we do certain things. Why do we behave the way we do? Why do we think the way we do? Life is so busy, right? We don't have time. Every day I pass by my colleagues, I'm just like, good morning, don't, don't tell me. I don't even ask, how are you? You know why? Because one day I realized my epiphany said, Jar, you're really hypocritical. Because if you ask people, how are you? What if the person say, I'm not fine. So can you have a moment to listen to me? I was already long gone, right? I, so I started to say, okay, good morning. <laughs> All right, so nice to see you. That's fake, right? Because life is so busy, we don't have time. So I appreciate you take your time to come here really to think about what is culture? Who am I? I'm all about individuals. So I want to start being very personal. Share a little bit quickly about my personal journey. I want this to be interactive. I want us to have a chance to dialogue. So who am I? Obviously, not really obviously, right? I could be mistakenly think I'm a Japanese and Korean and I'm Chinese. I was born and raised in China, I had my education in China. My very first job took me to Africa, Uganda. I was working on the civil engineering project and had no idea. I, I was a professional interpreter. I was on the management side. I was exposed at age 20. I turned to 21, I started my first job. I'm thinking, what is this all about? Immediately I was in found myself working with a bunch of people. I have no idea. Our consulting firm is Canadians. Our electricity board is our employer who is in Uganda government. And I was the one privileged enough to be given all the opportunity to consult liaison. I'm thinking, my gosh, I'm 21. I went to my boss, who is a project manager, I said, I can't do this. I don't know any terms about how to construct the bridge, how to build a house, how to construct a road. And he said, you can do it. I think, I can. He said, you can. There's no equipment, no opportunities to be trained, no time to be prepared. I was simply thrown into the situation where you have to do major responsibilities. I had an amazing boss. He became my second father. And he was dismissed on the New Year's Day, a Chinese New Year's Day. It was a power dynamics. My CEO flew from China. It was a partnership, two companies from two different provinces. My CEO flew from China, actually called my parents. You know the Chinese culture, right? They can call your parents midnight, say your daughter has violated foreign policy. My mom faxed. At that time, we didn't have. We didn't have iPhones, so she sent the fax. Ja, what did you do? I said, Mom, what did I do? I have no idea. So my boss flew all the way to tell me, Ja, we, you are being paid by me, but you are taking a stand for this person who doesn't work for our company. I remember at 21, I said, Mr. President, and I was crying, right? I'm 21, I'm so young, I'm here to learn technical stuff, I'm not here for politics. Two decades later, I still haven't learned politics. I refuse to learn. <laughs> I think we all take a stance, right? So I quit my job, it was a four-year contract. 
At that moment, I believe I decided I can do this. I cannot imagine a national hero awarded by Uganda government who worked in Africa for 20 years was dismissed on the New Year's leave. That was the night they chose to dismiss him. I remember when we had 500 people celebrating our Chinese New Year, like Christmas here, I chose to stay in his office with his assistant. We toasted, we cry. I'm thinking, this is not right. This is not how people should be treated. I don't care what kind of politicals, I don't want to know, but this is not the way people should be treated. I went back to China. I told my dad, Dad, I'm quitting. My dad said, no way. Your CEO called me and said, you have a bright future. You have potential. They're going to develop me. I said, I don't care, Dad. It doesn't work with me, right? At some point of time in your life, you always think, I have to work somewhere where I can share the vision, share the value. I don't fit in, Dad. I wrote my letter for resignation. Guess what? My dad edited. So I submitted, and I quit. It was a four-year contract. I didn't want to go back. Then I went back to Africa on my own, and I became my parents worried I was very wild. I just fell in love with the culture in Africa. Simple people, friendly people, very simple-minded. So I went back to Uganda, second time, worked for private industry. Very quickly, the customers liked me. Actually, it was a lady who went to Canada, so I was running a business for her. When she came back, she wasn't happy. Oh, everybody likes you, what's going on? And I was fired, right? Seriously, I was fired. Because she couldn't handle I was doing better. I was a threatening element to her. I never understood. She fabricated a lie, and I laughed. I'm thinking, wow, mom, I'm not coming home. You never supported me, so I'm going to stay. So I work for another construction company. So in your 20s, you have a lot of guts, right? You do things now. You look back and say, hmm, John, I admire you in your 20s. You can't do things today anymore. I'm a mom, right? I think more realistically. So that experience taught me, wow, people cannot handle when you become a little bit better. She was the queen. She was the queen in Kampala, the capital. Everybody knew her, Madame Fang. Now here's another young girl, 20 years younger. She couldn't handle that pressure. I wish one day I could go back to Africa, face her and say, what is wrong in our relationship? I was too young, too naive. I didn't want to confront. I wasn't comfortable. I packed my suitcase and left. Fast forward, I, went, I came back to China. Oh, actually, I didn't mean to fast forward that way. Um, then I went back to China. The first two experiences working in a corporate really taught me why organizations fail. My first company was a big company, Africa. Everybody knew us, Sietco. The moment I landed in Uganda, people wave at our car. I fell in love at the first moment we saw people because they have so much facing the company. And this is the largest project for Uganda. It was taken back by World Bank, gave it to another company, small company, Central Europe. Two years later, my friend called me and said, Ja, how did you foresee we're going to fail? I said, I didn't foresee. I just didn't like what I saw. Right? I did not like what I saw. And I made a decision early on in my life, if I cannot stay in the company because of the culture, I'm not going to stay. Most people will stay because they are afraid. They don't know what future holds. I made a decision, I can't work in a place if I cannot make a change. So coming back, I see I become really passionate. Why organizations fail? Why can't we just get along? In the past two years, I was working with a lot of CEOs in industry distribution. That was my blessing. One of the questions CEO asked me, Ja, why can't we engage in difficult conversation? I'm thinking, wow, what, isn't that a great question? We teach our children, baby, you got to be honest. Why can't we do that? I study organizations, I study people. I'm thinking, yeah, why can't we do that? In my workplace, I'm known as a professor who cries. My students call me crying professor. I cry because I'm happy. I cry because I'm angry. I cry because I'm excited. My, my son says, mom, you cry for everything, which is really scary. I say, yes, but I have a box of tissue. I'm not afraid of engaging difficult conversations. And I want us to think, why can't we? Because it's taking us out of our comfort zone. It's uncomfortable. Nobody likes it. Nobody wakes up and says, hey, what is the next conflict I'm going to look for and then solve, right? We don't. We don't want. We pretend everything is fine until the point I absolutely cannot tolerate anymore. I'm going to explode, right? That's a scary moment. 
So in Nigeria, I was very lucky. So I, my passion took me to England. I want to study management. I want to become international culture ambassador. I want to do so many things. I went, to I went to Africa, and I had a chance to go back to Africa this time in Nigeria, working with the largest transportation company in West Africa in Nigeria. It was a weird experience because I have a lot of goals. We were done a lot of interviews. I was in charge of performance appraisal for the company. Of course, not surprisingly, as a privately owned company, there's no former system, right? All the managers, the sisters, brothers, nephews, and niece, you name it. And by the way, this CEO is still one of the richest businessmen in Africa today, today, right? So one day, four months into this session, I was developing a training program for the truck drivers. I got a call from my project CEO, who is a Canadian, British Canadian, said, John, stop. I said, what's going on? I was fired. I said, what? You were fired? When? Now? Where? By phone? By who? By the owner of the company. I said, wow, people in Africa don't understand management. No wonder they're, they fail, right? The reason we're brought in to doing a reconstruction of the company is because they experienced financial decline over the several years. I'm thinking, okay, I can go back. I finished my thesis based on this unimplemented plan. That's okay. I'm doing theoretical work, right? I had a field experience, but I had a feeling people don't understand. That's why they fail. My biggest epiphany came into University of Georgia when I did my doctoral program, and I used this experience as my reflection for Simon. That was the first time I realized, you know what? You go into the organization culture, you didn't spend time to really understand who they are, what they have built up to that point. They are quite successful. Whether you call nepotism, relationship-based, by the way, coming from China, everything is about relationship, right? My mom is a VP in HR. I said, John, I want to I develop you into HR. No, thank you, mom. I made a decision in my 19. I can't do that. I can't handle relationship. I'm too honest, too abrupt, and I'm going to be in trouble all the time. <laughs> Can you see we're all dealing with people who are different, right? At that time, thinking we're too different, too complicated. That was the case in Nigeria. We came in presenting us as a superpower. We know everything you don't. We can do everything you can't. People's feelings are hurt. The owner say, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us? We've built this empire. You didn't know anything about it. We were kicked out. And he's still very successful, right? My friend called me several years ago, John, guess what? He's still one of the richest guys in the world. I say, obviously, corruption works. <laughs> By the way, corruption works in many countries. In my country, you have to. Several years ago, I, I told my mentor, I'm going to write corruption in China. Oh, John, if you want to get promoted, don't write yet. I haven't. I got promoted to full professor. Maybe one day I will, if I have courageous enough, right? I'm joking. So my, my experience, then I went to UK, here's another experience, and that's the first time I experienced as a woman in my team, you know when you do MBA, it's all about teamwork, right? In my team, here's a guy, came from Uganda, ooh, immediately I feel we are relatives, I work in Uganda for over two years. So I, was, I wasn't in his group, so dis decided later I joined his group. The next morning he came to my door, knock on the door, say, we had a group meeting, you not unanimously we decided we don't want you. I said, ooh, nine o'clock in the morning, that's a little bit too heavy. <laughs> so I was kicked out of the group. I'm thinking, what is wrong with me, Ja? And I called, actually there are two friends in the group, one from Taiwan, one from Malaysia. They're both my personal friends. Then I called them, what did I do? He said, oh, we didn't, never had a meeting. Ah, and I reflect, yeah. You know, in the Asian culture, uh, people are not very passive. So I went in the group, decided I'm going to be this assertive woman. So I spoke up. That became a threat. So I was kicked out, right? We, I confronted him. We never had a good relationship. But I confronted him in the hallway. So up to this point, I'm not telling you these stories random. Every story taught me something, ooh, I don't like people. <laughs> I love people. Why do I not like certain people, right? Fast forward in Georgia. As a graduate student, I was doing my uh, PhD. I work uh, in Georgia Continuous Center for Adult Education. At that time, they were going through leadership changes. 
downsizing from 600 employees to 300 employees. And I witnessed three leadership changes. So you can't imagine, I was a student. I don't have a personal stake, but my personal stake was please give me graduate assistance so I can graduate. And that was the year all the graduate assistants were cut. The funding was cut. I said, what am I going to do? My boss said, John, you're not going to have a job. Who do you think you are? I said, you know what, John? I can go to the director. The only thing I can lose is he's going to say no to me, right? I packed my courage. I went to him. I said, sir, I need this because ABC. He said, John, you got it. I said, I'm sorry, sir? <laughs> you got it. I became the only graduate assistant assistant in the center for the next two years. And I thanked him. He actually, Tom Games, it's, he's an amazing leader. He had a Institute for Ethics, and I always remembered him, how one leader changed your life and in a ways he would never imagine. Florida, my very first job, very serious job, right? I, I want to be successful. This is my first job being in the United States. I work really hard. I was assigned 34 doctoral students. That was my job in satellite campus. And I went in there being the youngest among my students. My students are practitioners. They say, who do you think you are? So first class, I was challenged. I say, ooh, OK, no credential. My predecessor was one of the top seven trainers in the country. She was fired. And I hear I was, I was hired in replacement. I say, well, since I was young, no name, you ask me a great question. Let's talk about me. Obviously, I have something she doesn't have. I don't know her, but there is a reason why I'm here. I take my job seriously. You need your PhD. So you need me. I need you. Let's work together. Two weeks later, my, my senior VP student everybody look up to called me and said, Ja, you won our heart by being so honest. We become a family. In three years, I graduated 13 doctoral students because they, I made a commitment to them. That was experience. And I didn't plan to come here. Honestly, I, I had a good time right, with my students until we have a dean from Canada who is entrepreneurial. She decided, I don't like decentralized location. Our university, Barry University, has six different campuses. She said, I want everybody to come to Miami. And here you go, Ja. You're going to come to Miami. I'm thinking, OK, two hours and a half later, and my little condo divorced mom with a three-year-old. I can't come. So six months later, I show up in her office and say, ma'am, can we talk about your plan you offered? How do we make it work? She said, job, university has a budget cut. Everything is froze. Let's pray for the market to come back so you can sell your house to move to Miami. For the first time, I walk out of the door. I never curse. I think I managed to use one English word to curse a little bit in my heart. I was that angry. I said, wow, that's a phenomenal leader, right? Seven years later, my house is upside down. I went through foreclosure. She has no idea. I still have that condo. I went to court. I cried. I, she has no idea what is the impact she made on one individual employee. She will never know. She will never understand, which probably she will never care. But I am here. Very blessed. Thing. Thank you for bringing my life upside down. But here I am in amazing culture. I reflect, I love reflection. You know, sometimes people accuse me, Ja, you're too philosophical. I think, yeah, life is not. So let me just be my philosophical me. So I study workplace incivility. I love culture, not because I just love culture. Because the more I experience in my personal life and career, I fundamentally really want to know why people cannot get along. We have a lot of amazing people at work. Why can't we engage? You know, one of the CEOs got really mad when we talked during, during an interview session in San Jose two years ago, complaining, coming, look at my employees. They don't even care. There is a trash on the floor. Nobody's picking it up. And he was complaining, dominant employee. Finally, I got fed up. I said, sir, you've said enough. What have you done to make your employees understand that's very important to you? What have you done to encourage those behavior besides just complaining, 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 right? So I want to share with you some of the stories I have collected from my interviewees. That's why when I go through life, I'm thinking, wow, there are a lot of things we take for granted. Here are very small things, right? Look at this one. My boss would criticize me harshly all the time. Have you had experience being criticized in the public, feeling embarrassed? just for who I am, until I cry. He would write down my problems, like 20 of them, not just one. 
then he would make me read the list in front of my colleagues in a big meeting. I thought coming from China, losing face is Chinese thing. It's not. The more I started to know people, the more I realized, guess what? We're just human beings. My very first class I taught, very first, uh, first class I taught in Florida was workplace diversity. I'm thinking, ooh, I'm the most qualified person to teach diversity. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. But for years and years, living outside of China, I was very conscious who I am, right? Oh, is there any Chinese face? And I get really intimidated. Yesterday, I was in Chicago presenting to a group of CEOs of billion-dollar companies. I was scared to death. I called my husband and said, if I can survive, I'm going to do it great. <laughs> because I was that conscious. Here, I'm a woman, younger. Why do they want to listen to me with an accent? Why do they want to be convinced by me? Guess what? Over the years, I learned. When I come to the room, I don't see Chinese, American, Latinos. I see people. I see people. We all get happy, angry, sad, frustrated, depressed, because we share a lot of common emotions. Doesn't matter which country you come from. We are people in the first place. That's why we're here, right? And here's another story from my participant. My boss told me that I had to work much harder. Hmm, has your boss told you you have to work longer with less pay, less resource? And my evaluation was not good because I had to go home early around 6 p.m. Hmm, that's pretty early. It was too early for everybody to leave the company. My mother was ill and depressed, and my father had bankruptcy. I took care of my mom. I thought I was doing fine, but evaluation went down. Different culture has different value for working hours, right? For, and for some of us living in an Asian country, particularly Korea, I just had a student did a study on Korea. The longer, the better. Even I don't have anything to do, I'm going to be in my office until my boss leaves at 10 o'clock, right? Or my supervisor, just to show, guess what? I'm working really hard. Even I'm just Googling, shopping, planning for my next vacation. I want to show I'm hardworking. Do I care? Do you care? People come and show. Do you care about what they produce or how much effort they put? My students tell me all the time, I think I'm becoming tougher, tougher. I told them I'm not cruel. I want to be fair. My students say, John, you have no idea how long it takes me to produce this paper. You gave me a C? I say, you know what? I love all of you. That's my problem. <laughs> I cry all the time when I say goodbye at the last class. But I have to look at what you produce, right? In corporations, people say, I spend 10 hours. Here's what you pr produce. Perhaps you, you need a little bit competence training or something missing, right? End of the day, what are we evaluating? Is your effort or it's what you produce, the quality, right? Here's another story. I know I'm loading you up with stories. I do a bunch of work for someone, but I don't get any feedback. Hmm, do you get feedback? Or do you give feedback? How often do you give feedback? And we do feedback all the time, right? Was it good or is it not good? What is being done with it? It doesn't have to be a whole booklet. But I do think it's rude. If you finish your job for someone, that person doesn't even give anything back for it. And I tell my students, oh, you want my feedback on everything assigned to you. Why do you give me feedback at the end of the semester? That's not fair. You don't have a chance to. To, to get a better education, I don't have a chance to correct my behavior. So I do feedback every session. I have a feedback sheet for every week. You tell me I speak too fast. I do. I get excited. I get hyper. I speak faster, faster. My students say, just slow down. I come back next time. I say, thank you so much. Raise your hands when you tell me I'm going too fast. I take feedback seriously because that's my only chance to improve. So how often do we give other people feedback? And we're ask for feedback, right? See, how am I doing this week? Is there any room for me to improve? Oh, here's a stereotype, right? I'm a male nurse. I'm subjected to, to rude behavior. People ask, can a man be a nurse? Everybody in my family knows when we were sick, my dad is the only one we want. My mom doesn't. She gets panic, right? <laughs> She's in a corner. My daddy's the one. Say, dad, I want you to stay. When I had my baby, daddy was the one in the hospital with me, right? So we stereotype people. As your experience and uh, knowledge increase, your supervisor is displeased with you. Hmm, they're trying to frustrate you. We go to another workshop. We come back with lots of passion. 
energy, knowledge, skills. They say, boss, let's do it. Early on, I do study on MB graduates. I was fascinated by managers' behavior. So I interviewed a lot of managers in China who went through my MBA, Western style MBA. Everybody tells me, oh, I learned so much. My mind is opened. I say, what do you do then? I'm leaving for a job. Everybody I interview at the edge of leaving the company, I say, why do you do that? I give my boss a new report. Here's something I want to do. It's been there for six months collecting dust. Finally, my boss told me, wow, I read your work. Come and present to the management team. Guess what? Ooh, it's too innovative for our company. We're not ready for that. I teach HR practitioners all, all the time. I'm very blessed. My students are all working practitioners. Every class we teach, they get really fired up. End of the semester, they say, John, I'm so glad I've learned so many things, but I'm going to go back to be so sad. I say, why are you sad with your new knowledge? Because I'm going back to the old system. Nothing can be changed. I teach change. and think, you can't change other people, can you? You can only change you. You can only change the way you work and interact with other people, and people will start to notice and pick up your behavior. It's all about mindset, right? How do you look at the issue? Here's another one. In academic context, look at this one. I hate my PhD advisors. Since he thinks people are machines, he expects PhD students to work 80 hours per week. But as an international student, I'm only allowed to work 20 hours per week. So to get my PhD, I have to work 50 hours illegally, for which I'm not even paid. This is not acceptable. How many people working in non-academic contexts feel being bullied, taken advantage of, but yet they're afraid of speaking up, right? I've experienced that every single day. My colleagues say, oh, Ja, you're being bullied. You study bullying. You understand. I say, why didn't you speak up in a meeting? Why didn't you? I need her vote so I can get promoted. Wow. I say, so my vote will not be important to you. We don't want to speak up, right? We don't. We, we, we think about our consequences on us. It's me first. That's a human instinct. I think this is the last one. When you are being treated rudely, you become insecure. When you have to make a phone call to the customer, you wait until the other person is going to the bathroom so that you can speak freely. Otherwise, the other is on top of it again with gestures. Then you think, please, not now. It makes you really insecure. You literally get blackouts. Do you have people you feel threatened at work? There are some people I say, wow, please go away. Don't listen to how I interact with my customer. I don't want you to be criticized me again, right? Ah, I have one more. I was working too much. I had all the responsibilities and risk. Eventually, I was hospitalized and had a surgery. I felt like I was being killed by the company. Even after that, they never increased the number of workers. When I, was, when I made a mistake, I was forced to write a sign letter to say, I am the only one who is responsible for the mistake. Oh my gosh, why are you still there? Because I need a job. I grew up in China. We have billions of people, right? People hate their jobs. I grew up, this is what I hear. I hate my jobs. I say, why don't you quit? This is a 10-year-old naive question. Oh, because I need it. Because I don't know if I can get a better one. That was the moment I said, John, you're never going to take a job you hate where people don't appreciate you. But sometimes we don't have options. What can be changed? There's something can be done. So far, everything I gave you, you're going to say, oh, Ja, this is a very depressing presentation. Not for the morning. <laughs> I'm here for sunshine, not for depressing. But that's a reality. We don't change reality, but we can change how we deal with reality. right? So I want you to think about, I don't know, in, maybe at the, towards the end of the session, we're going to talk a little bit, what is your story? Do you have your story to tell? Is a good story? Not so good story? What kind of story do you have? Okay, so by now, I've shared my personal story, the stories of my participants, people, companies I've worked with, and I want us to think about two questions. What do you hear in common? across all the stories, incidents, narratives. What is common? What makes organizations unique? 
We talk about culture, right? And I, I don't want to talk about culture. It's such a cliche. When we think about culture, we talk about leadership. We all know that. We teach that. We can't even get along. I ask myself that question. What is the excuse for us who are educated people who cannot do what we preach on a daily basis? What is the excuse for us not being able to do that? So I, I think about this question a lot. And here are the two things. Actually, there's only one word I want to share across all those experiences. It's human. We hear technology, right? Technology is trump talent, which, which I can tell you will never trump ta talent. People will always be in the driver's seat. But what makes us unique? Because we are humans. If I can deconstruct this word human for you, it's a three H, right? Human has a head. We process information. We learn new knowledge. People have hands. We apply knowledge we learn. We long for opportunity. And people has what? The most precious part is your heart, right? Whoever can win the heart will forever win success. So that's what I'm I'm very interested in. How do we win a heart? Here's a tough question, right? I work with the for-profit organizations. I, for years and years, I had excuse that, oh, I'm in human resource. Everything is kind of intangible. I don't have to justify. Guess what my boss told me, John? When you take a lead on this consortium, I was working on a consortium with 18 companies. You have to justify, quantify. I say, how am I going to quantify my happiness? Satisfaction, oh, you got to quantify. It's all about return on investment. I say, okay, I'll take you there for return on investment, but a different kind of return on investment. Okay, so here's the classic question, right? CFO cares about money, of course. Oh, what if I invest in you? Are you going to stay? I want to say, what if I don't invest in you and you stay? We are very, we spend a lot of energy on Excellent interview. Oh, why do you leave us? Why do you leave us? I want you to reflect in your organization today, yesterday, how often you have been asked the question, why did you stay? Why have you stayed with us for so long? What makes you stay? Do we do stay engagement survey? By the way, there's a lot of problem with our engagement survey, right? So when I was invited, I was thinking, ooh, I love this topic. Engagement is everything I'm passionate about. So here's the question. As you can see, this is a catch-22 question, right? Each party is looking for what I call pre-commitment. If you can be committed to me, I'm going to do this. If you show me you're committed, then I'm going to invest in you. We're not going to win in that catch-22 situation, right? So why do I bring up those questions? There's no standard answer because there are value assumptions. And I want each one of you to think about where do you stand? If this is the continue, where do you stand? And I ask all the CEOs and CFOs, you get an ideal standard question. Ooh, everybody is a talent. Really? What does that mean in your practice, in your policy, in your pay? It's not the same, right? So I want you to think about, do you think about people, we humans, are the capital? Ooh, capital, I can leverage, I can manage, right? It's just a resource we have, like a physical, like equipment, like financial. What do you think, I'm a cost, right? A lot of a company on the p and you are the cost we have to absorb. That doesn't sound very exciting, right? I want to avoid, reduce the cost. Or I want to take you to the last two. Do you believe... Everybody is a talent. I asked the first question to all the CEOs. Who is the talent in your own company? Oh, everybody. As the day go by, we, we talk more, and I'm thinking, that's not true. How do you see your custodians as a talent? And to what degree you reward that talent? I had epiphany last year. I decided, you know what? Every one of us is a talent. I'm going to do this. So I came to my work. We have custodian to clean your room every day, office, right? Take up the trash. And I made a point, I said, have I ever even bothered to ask about her name? I said, excuse me, I'm so sorry, I've never asked your name. Could you tell me your name? And she was a little bit surprised, about so and so. I said, I just want to thank you for making my office so clean and beautiful. Thank you for doing that. I saw surprise in her eyes, and I saw sparkle. I think I made her day. 
And at Christmas time, I wrote her a thank you note. I put a little gift. I said, I just want you to know you make my life so much easier. I don't want to take for granted. Do we do that? It doesn't have to cost a fortune. It doesn't have to cost a penny. There's so many things we can make you feel you are valued. I tell my boss all the time, don't raise my money. Guess what? We do, right? That would be a nice bonus. But if you don't, you can occasionally poke your head in my office to say, Ja, thank you for all you do for us. I really value you. That will make my day, right? People come because you win my heart. So when you see people has talent, you take a different practice. And by the way, do you believe we all have potentials? Yeah, neuroscience will tell us we will never in our lifetime use the full potential. What does that mean by bring out people's potential? What does that mean in action? Right? We say that it's just beautiful words we speak out. So the positive, if you look at the title, I didn't get to pick the title, but I love it. So I embrace it and thinking, what does that mean by positive? I don't want to talk about leadership. I want to deconstruct this word positive for all of us. A positive culture means four things for me. It means a purpose. During the summer, I was doing the blogs for a national wholesale association, so I've done a lot of research. Here's one wonderful idea I came up with. It's a job crafting. There are a lot of jobs which I consider not sexy, not appealing, not glamorous, right? Not everybody has a glamorous job. That was my dream in my, in my 17. I, t I told my dad, I want work a job every day, take me to different places. And my dad said, ja, if you find one, let me know. <laughs> our jobs, most of our jobs are not glamorous. How do I turn not glamorous job into meaningful jobs? And believe it or not, all of us long to make an impact big or small, right? Every one of us wants to make a difference. What does that mean by making a difference? The purpose for having an education, wow. A lot of people say, oh, I'm coming here. My PhD student was very straightforward in Florida. I came here, I need this PhD because it means $10,000 salary difference. I said, ooh, thank you for being honest. Let's do it. You need that three years, let's get out of here in three years, right? But if that's not a good reason, if we're chasing pay, we will never be happy. By the way, I'm a researcher, so I can give you research stats. When you have $70,000 above annual income, your happiness has nothing to do with your pay. Right? That's a Maslow's hierarchy, right? We're happy, we're safe, our stomach is full, and I'm looking for something else. I have a lot of colleagues who came from industry, coming into academia, I say, why do you take a half of the pay? Isn't that stupid? You have too much money, you don't know how to spare. No, everybody will tell you, I love to help people. What does that mean? Every time I hear my, from my students say, Ja, because if you say this, I've done that. I say, wow. The sense of accomplishment, right? It's something you cannot fulfill through pay. So what is the purpose of your organization? What is the purpose for a custodian to go to? go to work every day. Here's a fabulous study and which coined this concept of job crafting. In 2001, two professors in America, in the northern part of America, wanted to do a study. They wanted to look at what do people feel when they are in the unglamorous job. So they decided to study custodians in hospital in Michigan. What they found is something they couldn't explain. They said, my gosh, this is taking me by surprise. We don't know how to explain. When they interview the custodians, how do you feel about your job? The custodian told them, oh, I'm not a cleaning crew. I'm a part of professional healing team. Wow. When I read that, I had a tear up in my eyes. I said, wow. Good, good for you, right? Good for you. You can turn your job into such a meaningful job. And what they ended up to do, one of the nurses would go to, this is a cancer patient cell, so she would go there every day, give a cup of water to family who came to visit, or give a tissue box when they are crying, or she move around the pictures on the wall with the hope maybe that will give you new sense of hope to the patient. All those little gestures, they, they actually make a profound impact on patient and family's life. So the professor said, I don't know how to explain. That's the whole idea of job crafting coming to being, right? Job crafting. How do we make our existing, not similarly interesting job interesting? We hear this term all the time. I want you to love what you do, do what you love. I wrote a post on that. I'm thinking, 
G, what does that mean? Love what you do, do what you love. How many of us in our lifetime got to do both all the time? Sometimes, maybe, temporarily, we don't get to do all the time. But how can I show you, you're not in the business of educating people. You're in the business of transforming people. When I think about everything I do every day, I'm thinking, Ja, you are so blessed. You're transforming people's life. You better be a good teacher. You better be a good researcher. You better do the good service to your clients. They are my clients, right? So what is the higher purpose? Not just making money. Higher purpose actually evokes passion. That's the reason why we do things, right? Performance, I hate to say that. I sounds very performance oriented, but I am. Business exists also because of a performance. What is the product service you provide? Whether you're for profit, non for profit, who's holding us accountable? Here's the test, right? Babies do things, it's all oh, you're grounded today. I'm taking away your screen time. Why do we not take away screen time at work? When people do things that are not meeting up to your standard, I don't want to say anything because guess what? I want everybody to be happy. You can't. In the process of making everybody happy, you're making high performance not happy, right? So how do we create a culture where we can truly hold everybody accountable? Everything, I, I thank one of the speakers this morning. Every dis choice we make has a consequence. How do you deal with consequence? That takes courage, right? Potential. What are the learning opportunities? Gallup's 2017 study will show us people leave primarily for three reasons, right? I don't like my boss. I don't like people I work with, that's one big reason. But millennials will leave at work because there's no opportunity. That's number one reason. There's no growth opportunity. There's no learning opportunity. I'm not here for the job. Can we show them you're here for a career? not a job. What is the path for career? Very, very important for millennials. Whether we hate them, love them, my gosh. People talk about millennials, such a, such a heated conversation, right? I can show you a lot of positive things about millennials. But the millennials, the best part about them, they will take less pay for a shared vision, the love vision, because they long to make a difference. So the finally, I, I think I talk a little bit about this H factor. So I want us to think about culture in the, in the way, how do we capture people's heart? How do we win emotions, right? It's by winning emotions, I don't want you to just come here to be satisfied. I want you to come here to feel, what are the areas I can, I can look for to improve? And is there any tolerance for making mistakes? Is there any way I can experiment, I can fail? There is a room for me to fail. What is the consequence of failing? So when you engage people emotionally, which I call pay currency for the soul, it's called return on emotional investment. We don't talk about return on emotional investment, right? It's all about return on financial investment. No, I want us to talk about return on emotional investment, which doesn't have to cost you a penny. And you're going to get engaged employees, meaning I'm going to go extra miles for you, right? I'm not just going to come here and do the best. I'm going to come here to say, wow, what else can I do for you? I'm going to do things. I'm going to clean the coffee mug, dirty coffee mug in the kitchen when my boss is not watching me. I'm going to pick up the trash when nobody's observing me. That's called engagement. Then you're going to have satisfied customer in return and desire productivity. So if you do the things, if you do the things with the heart, everything else will come as a result. So I'm going to borrow Gandhi's line. And he said, a nation's culture resides in the hearts and soul of these people. That's exactly the same with organization. Organizations are made of people. So make the emotional investment in your people, who you hire, who you value. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Water to Wine Productions for recording this breakout session replay from the 2018 Brazos Valley Business Forum. This video was presented in part by The Bank and Trust. More information on the Brazos Valley Economic Development Corporation and its mission can be found at brazosvalleyedc.org. We also invite you to be part of Invest Brazos Valley, the BBEDC's private sector voice in growing our community.